Andy Ford, can I pass to you to, to give us a summary? And I think you're going to fire the first question as well. Over to you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Pippa. Well, I thought that was uh, amazing. And um, the idea of summarising it is finding it rather daunting at this moment. But I, I thought the um, the beginning where we, we, we sort of began to look at uh, at how the whole thing, the world scale thing, and uh, how we're building these cities at ridiculous rates. And I realised that, you know, that's not actually happening in the UK, it's happening elsewhere in the world. Um, and then we sort of, we moved on and we had a look at um, Alexandra and how she was talking about, well, initially her work in the W World Green Building Council and the importance perhaps of green building councils and that graph I saw and the shape of it and I recognize it coming from some <laughs> or I produced some initial work that was looking like a very similar shape and now it's got added in the embodied carbon it's really interesting to see you know what we've got to do how we're progressing how we're moving forward and then actually seeing some practical buildings um, and I have some question at the end of the day I think this is about practicality and it will come to it all so I'm not going to try and summarize everything but what I am going to say is that I thought that last bit by um, by, by David there was um, really interesting as it got towards the end it almost built to a crescendo um, and it came up with an ideas that I think is where my question would go. So it is about when you look at that big sort of uh, sector where the embodied carbon lies, masses of it lies in the structure and the foundations, and then there's all this other stuff. And you talked about fit out. Building services are part of fit out. The idea of shifting the ownership by a landlord of what they own how practical is that? Can that be done comfortably by a client? Um, and the other one I thought was lovely was the building materials as a bank, which is about architects really. It's about making sure that what you are constructing will be there for a very long time. And actually the idea that it's about ceiling heights, which I've always thought life is about ceiling heights if you want long time scales. Uh, that's really interesting. So. How do you get things, the idea of storing things into the practical life? So I, I will try and phrase a question at some point. <laughs> it's not getting there closely at the moment. But much of what my experience in life in practice is that uh, there is this sort of thought that it's all about risk. And it's always the client who is saying it's risk. Actually, I'm not convinced it's about risk. But I think the risk comes from within the design team. The design team say, we can't do that, it's too risky. So my question actually is to implement these things, and I don't mind who likes to answer it, how much risk is being pushed at you by uh, your clients? How much are they saying, no, that's too risky? How much of it is actually within us? It's risky, because we want to build materials as banks. We want the ownership of these things to change so that you can recycle things really easily. But how much of it is a client issue and how much of it is within our own heads in the design and construction team? That's the question. Who wants to answer? <laughs> Simon, seems to be it. I don't know how to do that. Um, um, well, I'm sure others will have opinions. I, I think, to me, the risk is actually not uh, doing things. I think um, if you look back, uh, and I mentioned this, I think, in one of the answers, in the written answers, that people like Kodak and Blockbuster Video took the conservative approach, and look what happened to them. They've, they've disappeared. And I think that the risk is, and I suppose the question is, where, who, what risk? If we're talking about planetary risk, well, then we've all got to get on and make changes. We've got to make the sort of changes that, that, that Dave has been talking about. We've got to make the changes that I've been talking about and, and, and indeed all the panel have been talking about. Um, and I think if we don't make those changes, the risk to uh, humanity is, is, is huge. And this was, I was particularly struck by this. I was uh, attending a, a session on climate risk 
um, which was being hosted by the Bank of England, funnily enough, and there was various other, there was various financial type people there. And one of those said that they are factoring in uh, into their thinking a, a, a risk that the, that uh, of fifteen percent that humanity will cease to exist at the end of the century. Well, I mean that is an extraordinary position to be in. So, or thinking about, and and if that is the sort of the sort of conservative end of the market, if you like, with the financiers, if they're thinking along those terms, then what should we be thinking about? What should we be thinking about that we're doing? So to me, that's the level of risk. And I think for companies, if they're not absorbing <clears throat> these sorts of thoughts, the risk to them is rather like blockbuster video or Kodak, it's extinction. You know, they've got to get on with it. Um, and I think on the other hand, there is a significant business case that you can demonstrate that there are Good business reasons for um, progressing and 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 uh, adapting these sorts of thought processes. I'd very quickly add to that actually um, that the risk. I mean, the, the great thing about working with um, commercial developers is that we have to think in terms of the market, and we've always communicated to them that the risk of completing a building in 2022 or 2023 or 2025 or 2030 and not being future proofed and not meeting the standards is that actually a competitor down the road is going to outsell you. Their homes are going to go quicker than yours. Yours is going to sit in the market. You're going to lose rent. You're going to lose um, 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 an, an increase in your in your earnings. So actually thinking about it from the commercial viability from their perspective, I think has been um, really useful for us to understand and communicate back to them, um, understanding what drives them as well as obviously people and planet. Um, but profitability is important. Um, and being able to speak that language has been really useful um, to us. And, you know, the risk of not having sustainable businesses it's just not having a business. Um, so we're future-proofing ourselves really um, by having this conversation now. Fantastic, fantastic. The, 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 the trouble I see is that, that, that humans are very good at dealing with the here and now. They're not so good at projecting risk into the future. And so whilst Simon, you're saying, you know, in, in the bigger global picture, you know, if, you, if we don't do this, we won't exist. Um, but people are far, far more able to assess risk now and the risk to their particular project where they've got skin in the game. Is, is that, do we have a tension there between the, 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 the future risk and the global risk, which is everybody, or me now, what happens to me now, my project, my job, this thing that I'm delivering? Is there a tension there? Um, well, I think... I suppose there is. I think nobody wants to be a first mover and everybody is very nervous about being innovative to the extent that you are putting yourself out in front to a point where you're leaving all the occupiers behind. They're not interested. But I think actually people are up for this. I think that the knowledge, you know, the sort of generic knowledge that, that the popular, the people are getting, that you know, people are aware that there is a climate crisis. I think people are aware that uh, you know, you can buy, people are worried about what cars they buy now, um, and the number of electric cars have rocketed. Um, uh, and I, so I think there's an awareness building across the, 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 certainly this nation and probably other nations as well, of course. But I think translating that, and, and, and I've noticed this with even um, project teams, which, you know, start off by, uh, and practices that I've indeed helped, where they have, um, being very enthusiastic to adopt these sort of principles into their sort of overall thinking. But when there's a project actually happening and you've got pressures of time and everything, it all goes out of the window. And I think we people, it's very easy to default to what you're used to, but we have to, you know, uh, learn to, uh, and somebody, uh, uh, it's actually somebody from Field Lake Bradley Studio, we're using the idea of carbon intuition, that we have to develop an intuition that, um, uh, enables us to, to automatically think about these things. Um, you know, for example, if, if, if you take an architect who, let's face it, probably on average don't know a great deal about structural engineering, but we can draw, and I'm an architect, we can draw a beam that's roughly the right thickness. It's not gonna be perfect, but it's gonna be roughly the right depth. Now that's because we have a, a, an intuition about these things. And we've got to develop that same level of intuition on things like carbon. You know, uh, we talked about the sort of things that David's been talking about with the sort of materials and so on. We've got to default automatically to 
uh, a broader way of thinking about these things. And it's just asking ourselves questions as we design. You know, we automatically do it about cost, for example, uh, as well. We sort of think, well, we won't use gold leaf because it's going to be really expensive. But we've got to think, well, we've got to use something that is more carbon efficient. And I think that's starting, but it's got a long way to go. And that leads yeah. me on to the next question, actually, I was going to say, is does it not come down to value engineering, cost and, and time pressures from the client? Um, at, 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 those are very real. So, you, so you've, you've got conflicting demands within the project. David, you've got something to say there. No, no I, I agree. I, and I think one thing I've seen in some of the case studies I've been looking at and talking to people is that it is actually running stuff offline and actually that's something that um, Landsec did very effectively for for their the forge project where they actually took a parallel design team uh, to the to, to the one that was running with the original design and completely redesigned the building as a platform uh, dfma project uh, and and created a whole new prototype you know basically out out in the stick somewhere they, they they built this whole thing and tested it and then they brought it into the project and they're now using it for for that project and 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 another one and i think this is probably one of the one of the two things to change it, you know we, we it, that's one way to to get new things to happen is to to just say we're going to just run something offline and then do and the same with you know looking for new materials and testing out all that stuff you can't really do on a live project you don't have time to you know leave the bricks out for a year and see if they you know fall apart but or, or, or they're brilliant you know but but actually what you can do is you could do that offline and test all that stuff as a as a client as a designer or whatever and then and then you can come very confidently to that to that place and i think the other thing that's really interesting that's happening in in amsterdam with park 2020 was that that actually they engage with the supply chain from the very very start and i think that's something so fundamental mm -hmm. that and we really struggle with in the uk is this idea that actually let's just let's just you know find a way around all these uh, procurement rules we're going to we're going to actually engage with the supply chain at the beginning of the project you get total certainty you can build a kit of parts out of it you can you can you can also even build they built some room for innovation in in that process by saying look you know we will give you the the whole of the business park if you get if you the contract for that if you if you change your product to the one that we actually want it and it's got to be designed for disassembly and all that stuff so those those are two mechanisms both of which in the uk hard to imagine we could possibly do but i think that's you know where we have to be okay so there's an element of if you show somebody something they they, they, they have a better grasp of it and trust and believe in it you're demonstrating it with sort of like a virtual, it's not quite digital twinning, it's real life twinning, you know, to, to, to build a looky likey project. Off, offline, yeah. offline yeah. process. And because one of the things I always get, and I always talk about this, is that I get a lot of stuff saying, well, what's your latest innovative products? And you go, this, that, okay, here's these ideas. And then they say, well, where's it been used before? And you go, well, I thought you asked for an innovative product. <laughs> you know, what's. <laughs> yeah. That's the whole point. Someone's got to actually take it. So doing it offline seems to be the only way. Absolutely, absolutely. So very, very, very interesting. Um, so um, uh, one question I wanted to 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 just pose to um, Tara and Alexandra, actually, who both have stakeholder engagement and, 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 and the client facing things. How do you persuade? David, you've talked about showing them things, but how do you persuade clients who don't have the appetite and vision? Tara, you talked about appetite and vision. Where you have clients who don't have that appetite and vision, how do you persuade people to, to start to think this way? Alexandra, do you want to, to speak on that? I can speak first, yes. Don't work with clients too specifically, but I do think a theme that's reflected in our roadmap and the recommendation and what builds on David's point as well is that those first early stages in the project are so critical. And that really involves all the actors that are there at the beginning to be able to push for some of these targets or ambitions within the project itself to try to avoid that later value engineering. And I think what's going to be really critical is yes, showing the evidence, but also just promoting general education on sustainability too. We don't have a good baseline level of education um, across much of the sector right now. And we do need that baseline to be able to achieve our different targets and goals as well. So pushing project partners on that direction, I think is critical as well. And I would add there, that's a really interesting point you're making, Alexandra, that we don't have much education. Those of us who sort of been immersed in this and, and eat, sleep and breathe sort of know, we, we've got the, 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 the sort of knowledge that we've got, 
we forget perhaps that other people don't. So constantly sharing that knowledge is quite key and not assuming that everybody's on the same page is quite key to that. Tara, how, how do you persuade clients who don't have that appetite and vision? Um, I think this is a really hard one for us specifically as a practice to answer, only because we're so heavily, um, we're very obvious about who we are. And so actually we find that the clients who come to us, we are not really persuading very much. The, the most persuasion comes is what standard are we trying to achieve, not uh, is this a good idea or not. So going going with that aspect, I think more and what I think... Um, um, applicants or developers or um, people who want to build in our environment are going to recognize that we are not unique in this. More and more built environment specialists will be saying, this is our baseline. It has to be a bottom-up approach and a top-down approach. So policy we know needs to change um, and get stronger. We know that um, um, local authorities need to write their own um, ambition. They've all declared a climate emergency in one degree or another. So actually, what does that mean? We need that carrot and stick approach. But from this side, we know that as architects, we'll continue to say, well, actually, this is the standard that we should be working with, because I think you know, we have a, the bigger picture in mind. We recognize that the planet is burning and the planet is in danger. So when we, once you know better, you can't design any less. So it's a, it's a, it's a really a non-starter for us. Um, I think when it comes to persuading clients. No, I think I think we could adopt that as a mantra. Once you know better, you can't design any less. Somebody write that down. It's, it's fabulous. And it, it does go back to your brand proposition, doesn't it? What's your position? What's your brand proposition as a practice? They don't I, I, for, for bottom dollar. I, I completely agree with Tara now. And I was gonna I was gonna say that actually it's um I thought I was gonna say I was in a rarefied environment where everyone is is desperate to do more, but it sounds like you're in the same place. So I think, you know, generally most most of the organizations we're working with now are, have made made net zero tar, you know, commitments to twenty thirty. And it's more actually they're going, How on earth are we gonna get there? You know, and I think and that and that's the that's the challenge. And it's been a such a revelation after twenty five years of doing this or, or more, probably uh, of actually not having to convince people anymore but more actually be challenged to say look okay how, how do we actually do this and, and i think it's it's a great place to be and, and that's but, actually uh, Pippa, can I, just say something? Because I, I think that it's really clear that clients are asking for things and i think that's a wonderful thing i was wondering if there's something that the local authorities and um, can can do which is about that mapping of resources of actually tracking where things are and uh, that's plays into BIM and smart, smart construction. And that is a high, high profile thing at the moment. So if we can start to track where everything is and others can put that together so the design teams have an opportunity to find stuff, maybe we make some progress with that. Yeah, maybe I think, I think you're right that we do need to track. I, mean, I, I worry about um, looking at BIM as the solution to everything because it seems like it's been for 10 years we've been saying BIM will solve everything it'll solve uh, you know integrated design and everything and we're still where we are so I mean I, I quite like the kind of uh, thing I showed which is that mapping at, at not at a BIM level really more at a, at a at a city level where you know they've done it with I think with um, you know satellite views and, and and Google Earth and all that sort of stuff and they've been able to I use think, algorithms. I think, I think city and, and town level things at the local authority level you said somebody's got to yeah. keep track of everything and somebody's going to say yep. where it is so yep. Yep. and that isn't Agreed. necessarily as consultants i mean we and I, and universities I, could do that so. Absolutely, and, and I love Globe Chain as well. I didn't mention Globe Chain, but they're you know they're one of the the, the newer um, salvage platforms that have, have mm -hmm. appeared, and, and I think they've been really good. And actually, uh, not only they are they doing a great job. I don't know if you've seen them, but if you if you go onto their um, their website, they they have um, resources from you know construction or, or demolition and strip out projects, uh, which goes out to uh, their whole um, platform of um, uh, of charities who who've uh, just basically just hoover all this stuff up in 20 minutes you know they say the trouble is one of the problems they've got is that when they release it all on a friday morning actually it's all gone in 20 minutes so they don't have a huge stock on their <laughs> on their website but i think those sorts of things are, are, are brilliant and actually i've taken may the the um, ceo of that to a um a project we were doing where we were trying to reclaim some stuff and we were getting some resistance and she turned them around she she just they were completely convinced by the end of the the, the half an hour meeting so because she's 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 up there she's doing it you know so 
So, so maybe David, a link to that would be fabulous. Simon, I saw you put your hand up earlier, so I hope we hope we haven't missed your point. Or you're you're still muted. So I've probably forgotten it, but I, I think the, the interesting thing about the uh, the mapping that Andy was talking about is that, of course, the tragedy is that the mapping is going to fizzle out at about 1940 or 50, well, 1950, say, because, of course, since we've been building with cement, I'm talking about the mapping, particularly with bricks. And as Tara said earlier, you know, it's to get people to buy into um, uh, lime mortar as part of the, the, the equation is, 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 is not always that easy. But I think this is where I think we've got to people who, you know, everybody from the design, from developers, designers, supply chain, we've got to realize that we're going to have to think very differently about all these things. And that actually things that are seen to be problems are actually opportunities. Uh, and I think that when you start to unwrap some of this, it really starts to kind of solve itself. Um, and I know that, I mean, you know, British Land, for example, I know I've, I've been working with them, they, to help them with this, they now, you know, all their design teams do whole life carbon assessments, they're even looking at how they, how that works with their existing portfolio standing assets and how they uh, monitor, if you like, module B. Um, and so it is possible, and they also have created their own internal market, uh, and they are now trying to get their whole portfolio to average 500 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Now that's interesting because what it means is that the, their development pipeline, instead of being totally new build or substantially new build, is having to be more mixed and match. They're gonna to have to be, and they're already realizing this, they're gonna to have to be doing more retrofit and less new build. And the new build they do do is gonna to have to be a lot better. Uh, and you know, you only have to look at sort of buildings around King's Cross, Liverpool Street and so on, where they have, or, and Triton Square and so on, where they've already, Re reused substantial structures, which they maybe 10 years ago would have demolished. Yeah, and, and that, that brings me on to, to, to one of the questions. I mean, it's Chris Twin, hello, Chris. Um, the, he's saying the majority of reused materials do not come with the performance guarantees that new materials come with, such as, you know, m and &E systems, waterproofing, et cetera. Given post Grenfell, how do we demonstrate the, the performance quality of what's going to be installed? Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, I, this is one of the many barriers, isn't it? And I, I always say I could have written a book about the barriers to a circular economy, but it wouldn't be very interesting. And I don't think anyone would bought it. But, I, you know, I think it is, a, it is a massive barrier. And I think, as I was saying, as my example is, is, is I think we need brokers. Uh, and, and, and there's a lot, there are manufacturers, not in the construction industry generally, who have set up a sort of parallel stream of, of um, you know, remanufactured products. Uh, I think Renault is the one that a lot of people quote, but there's a few uh, of these um, people and, and the, the, the raised floor tiles RMF are, are a, a sort of the prime example. We need, we need more of those. People that take back products will re-warranty re them and, and, and test them and, and stuff like that. And I think we need maybe even on on-site testing of, of steel and all the other stuff that we've been talking about. But I think hopefully, you know, this come this is this is probably a sort of top down meets bottom up thing where where the policy in, in certainly in London and maybe other places will start to push this 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 demand. Uh, and then, you know, architects and, and designers and, and clients will start to say, well, where is this stuff? And then hopefully we'll get some brokers that will come to the fore and say, oh, well, we could do that. You know, and we're not going to just make new stuff. We'll also take back our old stuff and clean it up a bit and sort it out. And sorry, while, I, while I've got the mic, uh, Simon mentioned about bricks. Um, and and if, you're, if you're in new new bricks, but Manchester University have developed or are developing a, a method to punch out the mortar out of bricks. Uh, and it's still at the lab stage, but you think remarkable, isn't it? That we could be, here's, here's where the university's come in, you see. You could actually be go onto site. You could create, you basically create this sort of metal formwork thing and it just goes and punches all the mortar out. There's a, there's a point of slight weakness between where the brick meets the, 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 the um, Portland cement. And you can actually reclaim the bricks back and I can even show you them if you want. Um, Wonderful. And what, while you're looking for that, isn't it great that universities have some use? <laughs> um, <laughs> we've got to find some use for you guys haven't we really <laughs> it's, it's, so heartening. it's heartening thank you for that thank you for that um and, and also i do have questions about materials here from from the um from from, from the q a session i've got um simon cash asking how did using aircrete impact on acoustic performance i think that's is that to tara 
who used the air crete and then and also somebody else anita kind of is saying um will extreme heat impact the materials for example ink in bricks and you know creating fumes I'm That's a good question. I'm going, to, I'm going to start with the last one first and say, I hope not. Um, <laughs> at the moment, it's being sold very much as uh, looking like brick uh, is. Um, it is compressed, it's not fired. Um, so in terms of performance, we expect it to uh, work the same. This is first year. I think they're again, they're, they're currently in the process of getting their BBA and EPD certification and all that good stuff. So, um, but we've got some samples here in the office um, and they certainly look, feel, act like brick um, and we're happy to go with it particularly because we're using it on a, a single story building um, so the, I guess we were talking about risk earlier and innovation earlier it's important for us to push innovation um, and de-risk it by how we use it um, and so that's why this is the the type of project if you like to use it on um, and then the first question next which is um, about acoustic performance or um, air crew we know that H&H &H, Selkin have been doing a lot of research on this um, and that's often the um, challenge that I guess the industry is so used to in terms of the acoustic um, quality but suddenly using sort of thin mortar um, we're using them with um, the with our party walls so we have the cavity um, so in terms of perf performance, in terms of acoustic performance, it matches um, sort of masonry that we're used to. It, so it has the thermal as well as the acoustic performance that, we, that we're expecting. Um, with our party walls, we're still, um, for example, um, incorporating acoustic boards on, on, on either side and then um, plus the boards. So um, acoustically it works as it should. <laughs> okay, okay. So um, some something that, that's actually um, occurred to me is I, I remember years ago buying five or six copies of Cradle uh, of uh, Cradle to Cradle for, for for the designers at Fulcrum because it's such you know it's so critical this materials issue and one of the things in Cradle to Cradle talks about how we want virgin materials and I see Phil Shepherd here is asking that when you look at retrofit for commercial buildings slightly different thing but it's similar. Um, there's a significant challenge with what people need now and often expect on parameters such as daylight space and the psychological feel, but also the, the, the newness of, of the materials that are being used. An old pokey interior with small windows and low ceilings will feel less appealing for most people than a modern office building. How do you get around that? We've got these legacy buildings. How do we bring them up to speed? And then my next question is going to be about how we design for the reassembly. But this one is quite critical. How do we get around that? Simon. Um, I think that, I mean, the, the, the curious thing is that the buildings that we're talking about quite often are capable of a degree of change. Uh, and it, 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 certainly there are plenty of examples of buildings from the, uh, well, from the whole of the last century um, and indeed buildings from the previous century, the 19th century. There are plenty of examples of those sort of buildings that have been upgraded. And I think a lot of it, is requires a level of ingenuity and requires a level of uh, innovation by the designer uh, and vision and so on by the by the building owner and developer. And I I think there must be very few and far between buildings that really are not capable of being upgraded. Um, I think um, this is often the kind of uh, I think excuse put forward that you know and and, and I, I, I I've been involved in several schemes where. Or, or several activities where people are objecting to the demolition of buildings. And of course, the, the demolition of the building is justified by the fact that it's you know, past its useful life, it's no, no longer fit for occupation. But that's really because people really have probably bought the site based on the assumption that they're gonna build a new building. And so they have to justify this. Um, but I think that if people start with the recognition that when you buy a site, you start off from a retrofit position, you start off from the assumption you're going to keep the building and or extend it and or um, uh, 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 you know, maybe enlarge it in some ways, but fundamentally you keep the, the existing building, then I think um, that will change. And it obviously there's an economic issue there uh, or the, the economics of site purchase, if you like, uh, yeah. and construction. But I think, you know, that. I think all the bigger developers have started to move on this. I mean, I mentioned that British Land, but Land Securities is doing the same thing, Land Sec are doing the same thing. And certain developers have just made it there. I mean, I know that um, 
Great Portland and the States, for example, it, you know, their whole thing is buying knackered buildings and sorting them out. Um, and obviously there, there are from time to time what I think were now known as stranded assets, by buildings that are beyond sort of economic use. Well, that will happen from time to time. But I think, um, I think we need to be more ingenious. We're going to have to be. I mean, I don't think there's an option here. I think we've got to figure out ways of making these buildings function better. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, that's uh, probably enough for me. <laughs> okay, well, the, 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 the other question that has been asked is, um, let me just scroll down. Um, what, uh, we have so many questions, it's hard, hard, hard to find them. The, the question is, how do we persuade, um, how, how do we train people to design for reuse as a as a as a practice to do that piece the architects and designers how do they design for reuse as part of their sort of toolkit for for meeting client briefs so that's a specialist skill how 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 does that how should that happen as as not being a designer, it's really easy to, for me to make some some broad sweeping statements around that. But it would it would feel to me that it 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 is just having to to accept that you're not going to get exactly what you want, maybe, and you have to design um, based on what's available. And maybe that's maybe that's uh, one of the answers. But I'm I'm sure the architects in the room could answer it better than I could. <laughs> the exact question was: Does anybody have learning resource recommendations for designing for disassembly? or do they work with consultants and companies directly for early advice? Or is this a skill that the architects themselves have, designing for disassembly? Simon. Um, I think sort of partly to answer this question and partly the previous one, I think that um, uh, one of the problems is incentivizing clients to want to encourage their teams to do this because you're asking them to design for something that is going to occur probably 50, 60, 80, 100 years in the future. And why would they benefit? You know, what benefit is there today in doing that? And I think we've got to somehow evolve a, a, a way of putting value onto disassembly. Um, and it may be that there's some sort of residual value to a building. I mean, if you think about it, a building once completed is only as valuable as it's, I'm talking about an office building, say, for example, uh, is only as value as it, its value is based on its square footage or square meterage. It is, that, that there's no value attributed to the materials per se, um, because the assumption is at the end of life that all that will go into a skip uh, apart, you know. So if you can create a, some sort of residual value to the, um, the that could be, can be shown on a balance sheet, if you like, at the outset, and you can say, well, three quarters of this building is capable of being reused in the future. Can that be ascribed a, a value today? I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I mean, maybe D D David could, but I mean, I think that we've got to somehow find a way of, 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 of valuing disassembly. And I know that some clients are starting to require this of their design teams because then they can, even if it's a separately accounted for figure, um, as it is required to be by the RICS sort of professional statement, at least you can, it sort of gives you bragging rights, if nothing else. Um, but I suppose it, it is a, a question of how do we value that? Okay, and, and, and in fact, I've just noticed that Tara has very um, helpfully um, put up some resources there in the chat. So thank you, Tara, for that. Um, we have come almost to the end. I'm gonna do a quick fire question to each of the panelists. Who, in your view, is the stakeholder within this entire chain that needs the most persuading to get with the program? Who needs the most persuading? <coughs> I'm going to put you on the spot. So let's. I'll. I'll, I'll we'll. We'll go around in, a, in in order of appearance. Simon. Simon. Who do you think um, you came first? Who do you think is the most? I think the one that would probably make the biggest difference is the government, both in terms of legislation and also doing their own projects. Yes, there's been some political um, stuff around that, hasn't there? Definitely on, on, on the um, on the estates uh, upgrade, definitely. Um, Alexandra, 
Who do you think you're you're the queen of of um, stakeholder engagement? Who do you think needs the most pushing along? To be honest, I don't think that's the reason. That's the reason I can't pick one necessarily, given our membership and all the clients or the groups that we've had say work on the roadmap. I, it's just hard for me to conceptualize it as one person needing to change as well, because even though it sounds a bit cliche, what I think we recognize in events like this is it's so critical for collaboration to occur across the entire project delivery chains of things. So it's almost like every stakeholder involved needs to get out of that siloed thinking potentially where they're only looking at one or two stages and then kind of view it as the end of their involvement. And really everyone needs to be a bit more involved every single step of the way. Um, in order to ensure a successful outcome at the end. And that is the principle of collaboration. It is that shared outcomes, not, not a, a negotiation thing as you go. It's actually having that same goal in mind. Tara, you're there, on, there at the, at the, at the um, coal face there, looking at all, all these clients in the face. Who do you think in, 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 the, in, the, in your world needs, needs persuading most? Um, I think the general public, I think when we can use our money to um, shop more sustainably, when we choose, for example, our new gym kits has to be from a sustainable resource, when we choose um, who we get our glasses from or whatever, I think when that translates to the housing market, um, then developers, applicants, uh, local authority, kind of forced uh, to providing better. Um, so I think the more the general um, public become more aware of the impact of um, good quality housing, the better for us as a society. So yeah, the general public for me. Wonderful, wonderful. And then I'm going to come on to David and then perhaps Andy, uh, give, you a, give you the last say. David, what, 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 would, you, what would you say here? Uh, well, I don't, I don't think there's anyone who's persuading but i think to make it to make it happen on a on a live project i think the the most critical thing is it goes in in that initial brief for a project and i think you know net zero and and circular economy has to get into the brief because uh, once it's once it's gone past that point then it's it's all up for negotiation really but if it's in the brief then it, it drives everything it drives who you procure to to do your design which means hopefully you get you know people with experience or knowledge of net zero or or an ambition to to do it and, and it and it drives everything so i think i think that's that's not persuasion but where we need to be brilliant andy can i put you on the spot um well since i moved into education um i suspect the answer long term might be um, when the public start asking for it, we better be able to answer it. And the only way that's going to happen is if we do train intuition across the engineers and the architects. Brilliant, brilliant. And with my marketing head on, I say that there's a big role for entrepreneurship here. There's a massive, massive entrepreneur opportunity here for, for businesses to really grasp this, um, you know, bring bring the salvage industry and the, the, the reuse industry into something quite magnificent. Um, and that will in turn influence. So I think we've actually got many, many points in the in the chain that that that, that need some revolution and some evolution. So um very fascinating. We will be staging another event in spring. We will be analyzing the questions that we received and there were too many to, to address them all, but they were very, very good quality questions and very, very interesting. Thank you, everybody. Thank you to our panel for coming along. I know when we say, can you give us 10 minutes on your, your, your life's work that we're asking for a hugely demanding task to, 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 to narrow it down. Um, we know that you've given up a lot of your time to be here today and that you, you put so much passion into what you do and, and you sort of, you know, through the sector. We're really grateful for that. To our audience, thank you for coming along. We will be sending out a video of the event or, or links to YouTube um, of each presentation once we've got those, those doctored. Um, and we will be in touch um, to uh, let you know what the future events will be. Um, we are looking to run in the very near future um, market transformation across retrofit and heat pumps or heat. 
And we will probably, I think, it feels to me like we need a market transformation module on embodied carbon as well, because these materials are so critical. And we will be um, sending out those details as soon as we can. And we will be focusing on skills as well, because that's very critical. And we will, of course, be doing embodied carbon again in spring. So stay posted for that. We will be in touch. Thank you, everybody, for coming along today and for making our fifth climate emergency event so successful. Thank you, one and all.